carvels were religious verses, um, often very long. You have a piece for up to 60 verses long, and they were on religious themes, and they were performed in churches all around the island from at least the early 18th century onwards until the end of the 19th, really. Um, their themes were all heavily influenced by the Bible. Some, some were retellings of Bible stories, some were retellings of the creation story, that type of, there's quite a, a, sec, a subsection of, of stories that begin with before the creation of the world and go on to the Garden of Eden and and Tudjum, the fall, etc. and the saving of mankind with Jesus bringing them on to the point of their Christianity. So they're like a kind of history of, of their religion really. I think they were useful in an age of largely in an age of illiteracy and some before the Manx Bible was printed. They would fix these stories in the memory, I think, and um, tell and retell them. I don't know who created them exactly, um, because there's no indicate they're collected in, in books, but the collectors who wrote them down weren't necessarily the people who wrote them and it's very rare that they're attributed to any writer. There are some associated with writers, quite a few were actually clergymen who, who wrote them, um, notably Thomas, the Reverend Thomas Christian who wrote a paraphrase of Paradise Lost, Parages Kyle, one of the better known and um, more prof more Mm. More proficient of the carvels, Roche Morau, Flaunus, Erna Cru, is attributed to him. And um, I think because it follows the story of Paradise Lost very well, I think that's probably the case. Other than that, I think there's no, there's no way of knowing who wrote them. Um, let me think. There's a, a mariner, I think, called John Moore, who wrote um, Carvel New Paul, Carvel of St. Paul, because his name is always affixed to the bottom of it whenever you see that Carvel in one of the books. I don't think they were intended as instructional pieces, even though they were written by the clergy. I think that they were an expression of private religious feelings that Want, they, were, they were primarily, they seem to have been primarily needing to be shared. And I say this because a great many of them begin with the line Mechaj and Dare, my dear friends, before they launch into their theme of what they're... Many of them start Mechaj and Dare or Mechaj and Grayach or something along those lines so that the singer or the chanter is, is speaking to everyone in the church with him and um, no I don't think so I think they were perhaps just just an expression of religious fervor really the 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 clergymen who wrote them were were Manx themselves so I think it was part of their religious experience as well well we're led to believe by the few accounts that there are that the people who actually composed them were the people who chanted for the most part they say they chanted rather than sang them and these were all exclusively men I think so um, they had their carvel their special piece for you know for the day in the year where everyone was present to listen to them and they were the people who were performing them They were performed publicly at the Ilveri, yes. They were, it was the one, they were, they were aimed at that. I know from odd bits and pieces that I've read that they might have, they probably went on thinking of them and adding to them 
throughout the year, but the Ilveri was was the night for the for, for the big performance. An Ilveri is described in at least three sources in a very um, prescriptive way almost this happened and then this happened and then this happened but I, I feel myself that they're all drawn from one source and the earliest um, source is the poem by William Kinnish which is the Manx Ilvery he describes an Ilvery as um, the young people of the district gathering together flocking to the church with their candles which they'd made at home and the girls were said to have made special branched candles for the evening and um, when the formal service was over and the vicar had gone home but the clerk apparently stayed presumably to lock up after them then the carvels began and it seemed to have been the older men of the district who would stand up and do their carvels while the young people started messing about um, throwing dried peas at them and that kind of thing and that's the sort of account that's repeated in Hawkins the Deemster for example almost word for word and A.W. Moore's introduction to Carvel and Gilgach also repeats that account whether that's typical or whether that's just re reiterating one account is hard to say. Other accounts are slightly different, especially later accounts, which, which um, depict an intensely dreary affair with you know a few old men standing up and chanting their carvel to the irritation of the parish priest who has been forced to remain. Earlier accounts, the earliest account goes back to 1705 I think and that's um, that's recorded because of the trouble of the fighting in the church because I think we must remember that in the dark in the in the very dark Manx winters and in the cold it was an excuse to be out at night drink was taken and um, there's an account from Balaf I think Balaf presentiments of uh, a Joseph Kane and a William Fry um, seizing the holly branches in, that were in the church for decoration and battering members of the congregation and you know obviously that didn't go down very well so that's the earliest one we know about. A slightly later account um, the see accounts vary as to whether the parish priest was supposed to be present or not. The commonly known one, the Hall Cain one and the Kinnish one, say that the parish priest went home. But this particular one from the 1770s have an account of various parishioners going to the home of the parish priest because he said he was ill in bed and they expected him to be there to do his duty so they were throwing stones at his window and causing a general riot which they were arrested for um, and because it had frightened him and his family because he didn't want to go but they expected him to be there so whether it's true that the parish priest was there or not we don't know the parish priest was there in a later one um, that we know of. There's a, sli there's a, a very downbeat, miserable account of one in um, Kirk Braddon given by, he was actually T.E. Brown's brother because their father was the parish priest of Braddon, I think, at one time. His brother, Hugh Stowell Brown, said that his father had been enraged and disgusted, or words to that effect, by the carvel singing in the church and had ordered them to leave because he thought they were being disrespectful to the Virgin Mary because she was eating one of their carvels. So, you know, a definitive account of what went on I think is not to be had really. Il Veri is popularly supposed to mean Mary's Eve and um, you'll, you'll see that. I think most people think that, but um, I think I would have to disagree with that because I ask myself why. Why is it Mary's Eve? Because it isn't. There's many, many 
saints' days throughout the year um, dedicated to Mary, but Christmas Eve isn't one of them. The other thing that makes me think that is um, it looks like and is written, it's written as the Manx name, Vora, but nobody ever says Eel Vora. Everyone has always said Eel Very. And I think it's much more likely that Eel Very comes from Ver or sometimes Bear which means to give birth and I think that it is much more likely to be the eve of the nativity or the eve of the birthing than Mary's eve. In fact the, our people, people do say that um, a bear is used of animals rather than people which I think is what's made people think that it's not that but there is a, a short line in Thomas Christian's Parges Kielch, which is something along the lines of J. Mudge and Glen, they and there, which means of a virgin, pure he was born. So we've got them using there, there anyway, so I think it's far more likely. Well, I would imagine having thought about it, that some of them, particularly the shorter ones, might well have been sung to sort of ballad tunes of the time. But the longer ones that went on for 60 plus verses, I would imagine they were just a fairly, I would hope, fairly rhythmic chant to keep themselves going, I would imagine. No, we shouldn't think of them as carols, um, although Carvel itself is obviously derived from the word carol and one or two of the carvel books call themselves carol books actually but they're not carols in the sense of god rest you merry gentlemen or anything like that but then i think we do have to bear in mind that the period of advent isn't a particularly jolly period anyway if you're a church going person <laughs> so we tend to think of church carol and Christmas carols as, as I said before, you know, the jolly Victorian style of thing. But in fact, you know, there are many Advent carols, if you want to call them that, like um, O Come Emmanuel, that are fairly dark in themselves. And um, yeah, the Manx carvels were quite, they were very serious, a lot of them, about saving your soul and behaving yourself. And, um, and thoughts of the afterlife. The later carvels were actually heavily influenced by the temperance movement. And they will frequently begin with some hapless youth in a tavern getting drunk instead of being in church and what will happen to them when they die. And uh, they will be once um, Lakin Iliac in fiery lakes in hell as um, they would be um, looking for Biden the Ushja, the Urcha and Jingyan. They'd be looking for a drop of water to cool their tongues in hell and that type of thing. I think the Isle of Man it was, it was generally not a rich island people's focus was quite heavily on their religion and um, as, as I say in the, in, in the cold dark winter nights a uh, drink would be sought to keep you warm and, and that's probably the, the source of the rioting in church and so no doubt it was but they were also very heavily focused on their religion and what was going to happen to them after they died it was a time of high mortality um, children died young, people died of things they wouldn't die of now and they, they kept their focus on the afterlife quite strongly. They were very um, heavily impressed, they were very impressed when John Wesley arrived with his type of religion and sort of moved from was their sort of Church of England to him in flocks I think and the, the later Carvels were you know, heavily influenced by that kind of religiosity. Although the Methodists themselves were quite anti the Carvel tradition because they thought they were 
too fervent, um, too long, and they didn't understand them because they were in Manx, and they were very keen to replace them with English carols and songs. I think it's important for us to remember what life was like for people in those days. I think they're an invaluable linguistic resource because there are very, very many of them. Um, many carvels have up to 20 different variations and they're really useful to compare in a linguistic sense. They inform us actually because they're not using a standard form of orthography when they're written down. They're written down as the person who was writing them thought they sounded and that's extremely useful.